Hello everybody, welcome to A British Audio File. If you're new to this channel, my name is Taron. Something that I get asked all the time in the comments section is, what do you think if I try this pair of speakers with this amplifier, or vice versa, what do you think they'll sound like? And the honest answer is, I have no way of knowing unless I've tried it myself. Sure, you can look at the measurements and that will reveal quite a bit about whether a speaker is difficult to drive and the capabilities of an amplifier. But whether you can tell if two components will sound good together by looking at the measurements alone? I don't think so. Let me give you a few examples. The Exposure 2510 was my amplifier of the year in 2021, and for very good reason. It sounds fabulous. I could say exactly the same for the Amphion Argon Ones, which happened to be my speaker of the year in 2021. On paper, they should sound very good together. They're price appropriate components. You have a slightly warm analytical sound to the exposure amplifier that should balance out very nicely with the slightly cooler analytical nature of the Amphion Argon Ones. They sound fine together, actually they don't sound bad at all, but it's only when you switch out the exposure amplifier for the Hegel H95 that you realise, actually, that sounds better. That isn't because it's a better amplifier. Exposure is the more accomplished amplifier when you test it with a wide range of speakers. There's just something about the synergy of those two that just works really well. It's a similar story with the excellent Wilsington R8 with stock tubes. It works really well with the Amphion Argon Ones, but if you upgrade the tubes to the PS Vein CV181 and KT88s, a lot of that improvement is lost on the Amphion Argon Ones. It's only when you step into something like my Proax that you realize what you're missing out. The synergy between amplifier and speaker is perhaps the hardest thing to get right with your hi-fi. Now there's some advantages to having a powered speaker, the convenience and space saving of having everything inside the box, but there's another benefit that perhaps isn't quite so obvious. You give the designer control of the amplification, and if they know what they're doing, that synergy problem is taken care of for you. So when Q Acoustics launched their excessively priced M20 powered speaker towards the tail end of last year, I immediately became quite interested in reviewing it. Q Acoustics has built a very fine reputation over the years that's well deserved for producing speakers that sound great at a price that most people in this hobby can afford. The 2000 series and the 3000 series both had standout models in the range. It's the 3000 series where the M20 gets its parentage from. I'll let the cat out of the bag here. This one's a little bit special. Let's see how I got on. The Q Acoustics M20 is a compact two-way powered speaker retailing for £399 in the UK, measuring 279 by 170 by 296 millimetres, or 11 by 6.7 by 11.7 .7 inches. You won't see the drivers as the grills aren't removable. That was done to be consistent with the M4 soundbar, but I can't help but think that it's an oversight on Q Acoustics part. Q Acoustics have developed the M20 to stand in its own right, However, it shares a lot of its DNA with the highly successful 3020i. The cabinet needs to be a little bit larger to house the electronics. But it appears to have the same 22mm 0.9 inch soft ring dome tweeter and 125mm 5 inch aramid fiber cone midwoofer, crossing over at 2400Hz. The powered speaker houses a 65 watt per channel Class D amplifier for both speakers. There are RCA and 3.5mm analogue inputs, as well as a digital optical input that would make easy connection to most modern TVs and other devices. The USB connection is great because it means that you can use your PC or laptop as a cost-effective streamer. For convenience, there's Bluetooth version 5.0. It supports a bunch of codecs, including aptX. There's the HD version that streams up to 24-bit, 48kHz resolution and a low latency version that will keep gamers happy. Back to the rear panel and you'll see a connection to hook up a powered subwoofer. By the flick of a switch, you can decide if the powered speaker is going to be the left or the right channel. There are three DSP settings that can shape, augment and attenuate the bass and lower mids by either plus 3, 0 or minus 2 dB, acting below 300 Hz. It means that you can adjust for room positioning and personal taste. And if you really want to shove the M20s up against the wall, you can always use the supplied foam port plugs. Both speakers are tethered together by a speaker cable with good quality shallow profile speaker terminals, again to aid close to wall placement. 
a truly wireless speaker system of this quality isn't really feasible for the price. Okay, so I've already let the cat out of the bag that this is a very fine sounding system, but I did something that I don't ordinarily do after I finished my listening tests. I asked if I could speak to somebody in the design team. I was able to do exactly that. I wanted to know what kind of magic sauce had been sprinkled over these speakers. And it turns out there are a couple of tricks up Q Acoustic sleeve that they're happy for me to share without giving away their secrets. But it really comes down to smart design choices and excellent implementation. I want to share with you now the highlights from what I learned from that discussion. All incoming signals are multiplexed through a Texas Instruments PCM9211 chip. Analog signals are converted to digital by this audio interface, while digital signals are maintained up to a sample rate of 192 kilohertz, 24 bits. DSD is not supported, but there's no downsampling of high res digital signals here. The signal passes to the DSP where it's contoured according to the room equalization setting. Basically, the bass response can be optimized by the listener for their listening environment or personal taste. Also extends the bass down to 55 Hertz. That's its minus six dB point in free space. In comparison, the passive 3020i speaker only extends down to 64 Hertz. The signal is then upsampled and fed to a Class D amplifier operating at 384 kHz PWM. A low pass filter ensures that only the analog signal in the audio band is produced. Most Class D power amplifiers convert an analog input signal to a train of high frequency PWM, that's pulse width modulation pulses. These correspond to the amplitude and frequency of the input signal. For the M20 system, which is predominantly going to be used with digital sources, this would mean that the digital signals would need to be converted to analog, passed through an analog volume control, and then re-encoded digitally by the Class D amplifier. What's clever about the M20 is that it avoids this potentially lossy double conversion through the analog domain, and it does it with minimal need for downsampling and upsampling. So let's talk about the sound quality. What surprised me about the M20s were how clean, how full, and how balanced sounding they are. I've heard many powered speakers over the years, you know, from the usual culprits around this price and a little bit more, but nothing's quite impressed me like these. The bass has good mid bass punch. I know you can tune it to taste through the three DSP settings, but whatever setting you're likely to wind up with, I'm sure you're gonna notice that this is a small speaker with a bit of authority Officially only goes down to 55 Hertz, but this is Q Acoustics. They are known for being honest with their specifications. Some other manufacturers just simply aren't. And that is the free space response. So with room gain, it will dig down a little bit deeper. But if you want a full range sound, you'll want to add a subwoofer. Just make sure it isn't a cheap and cheerful one, otherwise you'll ruin the sound. It's the grip and authority in the bass that really impresses with this speaker. And that's where that Class D amplifier just seems very well matched. That synergy I was talking about, it's all too clear here. If the lows are impressive, then the mids are equally as impressive. I'm sure it helps a lot when you've got an amplifier that keeps a tight hold of bass rhythms as they get busy. But it's the overall clarity and tonality that's on offer here that's simply superb. I try my best to trip it up with the usual things that I do, play a load of acoustic instruments and male vocals and female vocals. And it wasn't the speaker, it was me that came up short. There's a solid definition to the leading edges of notes, and if there's a nice decay present in the recording, you're gonna hear it. So many Class D amplifier systems and other systems around this price and a lot more expensive sound thin in the mid-range. They lack body, but not this one. Play a trumpet, it sounds like a trumpet. Play a saxophone, it sounds like a saxophone. And those butch sounding male vocals don't sound like someone's got one hand on their family jewels. Female vocals sound sweet, I'm not saying it sounds like they're present in the room with you. That would be ridiculous around this price, but at least they sound like it's a decent recording. Q Acoustics have pulled off a trick that Andrew Jones did with the original debut series. Do you remember them? The highs are just a touch recessed, not enough to rob the speaker of transparency and clarity on top, but just enough to ensure that they're not bright, harsh, and fatiguing. Sometimes that's a giveaway of certain speakers around this price. It's smart voicing but those of you who like a boosted top end are gonna be disappointed. The rest of you are just gonna marvel in its refinement. 
Imaging is very good, especially around the center where you tend to find lead instruments and vocals. Soundstage is okay, it extends a little bit beyond the speakers left and right. Nothing to complain about, but nothing to jump up and down about either. And there is a little bit of soundstage depth. It plays very good at low and moderate volumes, but as you do crank it up, that's where you see the limitations of the power kick in. So as long as you're not rocking out at 90 dBs plus, you're going to be fine. I'm not going to contrive any comparisons here. I haven't reviewed a lot of powered speakers around this price. Over a year ago, I reviewed the Triangle Alara LN01s for around £600, although regularly I see them for around £450 these days. And as far as I can recall, the M20s are a much cleaner sounding speaker. You could go for the passive Q Acoustic Concept 3020Is that retail for around £150 to £170. That leaves you £230 to £250 to spend on an amplifier with a built-in DAC with a USB connection as well. And you might well find something for that price that works equally as well, but if you're going down that route, I do wish you a lot of luck. I've owned the Q Acoustics powered speaker for the best part of seven or eight years, the BT3 that back then retailed for around the same price as the M20. It's a fine sounding speaker in terms of clarity, pretty much matches the M20. But as you can see, it's a much smaller speaker and it sounds smaller. The bass weight and extension dynamics and the openness in the mid-range aren't a patch on the M20. In many ways, these new speakers from Q Acoustics remind me of the excellent Acoustic Energy AE1s that were my speaker of the year in 2020. That's a proper analog active speaker system that may take sound staging, clarity, grip and control to another level. But that's a speaker system that retails for over a thousand pounds. Now, if you wanna know the difference or just remind yourself of the difference between a powered speaker and a proper active speaker, check out my review of the Acoustic Energy AE1s. I'll link it in the description. Back to the M20s. It's the sonic character of the M20s that reminds me of the AE1s. It has that weight and control in the lower frequencies, that openness and warmth in the mid-range, and that refinement, slight recessed quality up top. The AE1s clearly take things to another level in terms of performance. I don't have to have both speakers here at the same time to say that, but I don't believe I'm gonna say this, but I'm gonna say it anyway. In terms of value for money, I think the Q Acoustic M20s probably take it. I mentioned earlier that the M20s play really well at low and moderate volumes. I've also tested them in the near field and they sounded great, so I think they'll work well at the end of a desk. Just keep a good meter or so away from them. If you've got larger rooms, I think that's where they'll struggle a little bit. I wouldn't want to be more than two and a half meters away from these speakers and then similar distance away from each other. Once I got to about three meters away from the speakers, the coherence did drop down quite a bit. If you really like to rock out at high volumes, there's probably other speakers I'd choose over the M20s. I'm talking about when you've got a listening level in the high 80s with peaks going into the 90s. That's despite the speaker having a peak SBL rating of 103 dB. This is where you don't get a free lunch. If you're gonna use DSP to extend the bass response of a driver, you're gonna put a little bit more stress and strain on that driver. And that's why the clarity and control was noticeably less as you got to higher volumes. The M20s are pretty forgiving of room placement and those three settings that you have through the DSB for adjustment for free space, close to wall and corner placement is pretty handy and it works very well. But if you want to hear the best out of these speakers, like most speakers, unless they're specifically designed to work against walls, the soundstage and the openness instrument separation noticeably improved as I moved them away from the walls. I wound up with them about a meter away from the walls. You want that tweeter pretty much at ear height, so adjust your stands accordingly. I wound up with my target R4 stands propped up by four inch 12 centimeter EVA blocks to get it right. Also with the speaker towed in a little bit so that I got the right balance between sound stage width, a lockdown central image, as well as high frequency extension. Another noteworthy thing about the M20 is that it's not particularly fussy about which input you use. Whether it's the digital inputs or the analog inputs, there was no noticeable drop in sound quality. That's quite unusual in my experience of these DSP based systems where analog signals coming in are converted to digital and back to analog again. Even the very good sounding NAD M10 struggle with sound quality through its analog inputs. That's not the case here. So that Texas Instruments PCM9211 chip is doing its job very, very well. 
Actually, that's not entirely true. The Bluetooth does sound noticeably worse than the other inputs, so that should really just be considered something for convenience. There's one last thing I'd like to mention before I wrap things up. The supplied speaker cable is very thin. I'd replace it with something for a thicker gauge. I swapped it for an AudioQuest solid core cable, model number I can't remember because I've had it for ages. I notice that the base tightened up, the sound stage opened up, and the top end extension was much better. Q Acoustics have knocked it out of the park with their powered M20 speaker system. It has class leading levels of clarity, grip, and tonal accuracy. I'm sure it will be a benchmark product at its price that will go on to win many awards. It's that good that I'd encourage all of you to go out and listen to it, regardless of what hi-fi system you have at what level, just so that you know what's achievable for less than 400 pounds these days. I'm sure that many of you that do will wind up buying it either as a main system or a secondary system in another room, or even just to place either side of your TV because you're fed up with the darn awful sound that comes out of TV speakers these days. I'm sure you know where I'm going with this. The Q Acoustic M20s get an outstanding from this channel. My question for today is when was your favorite period during which hi-fi was being produced? Not necessarily when you think the best hi-fi was being produced. I just wanna know in the comments section when you were enjoying the hobby the most in terms of the new releases that were coming out and the reasons why. So please let me know. All that remains for me to say is if you like this video and you like what I'm doing with this channel and you haven't done already, please do that social media stuff. Hit the like button, share it, subscribe and hit that bell notification. Do check me out on Patreon for consultancy services as well as bonus content and video chats. But for today, for now, a British audiophile signing off.